Good morning, I'm Damien. And I'm Mandy. Welcome to Tunbridge Wells Baptist Church Online. This week I've been following the story of Jacob in my daily Bible readings and I've been struck by the similarities between his situation and our own situation in this period of pandemic. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 35. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I've gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Just following on from that, God said to Jacob, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and to Isaac I also give to you. Then Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place and he poured out a drink offering on it and also poured oil on it. What struck me in the notes was, was this idea that Jacob is being called back to Bethel, literally the house of God. It was a holy place for the nation of Israel. It was there that Abraham built uh, the first altar to God. In the time of Judges and Samuel, it's mentioned as a place of justice, a place to inquire of the Lord, to worship, to repent, and to seek God's will. It provokes this incredible reaction in Jacob. Uh, he wants to completely declutter. He wants his whole family to throw out these idols that they're carrying with them and focus on the one true God. Uh, we need to take stock, perhaps, removing anything that draws our hearts away from God and instead warm our hearts, like Jacob, with the promises that he gives us. And to help us do that, Jack and Alice are now going to lead us in some sung worship.
of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you To see you high lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy Holy, 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 I want to see you. Holy, 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 holy. I want to see you To see you high lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy See you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy I want to see you I hope you've all been enjoying this lovely sunny weather perfect for the summer holidays and also for those of you on vacation or staycation. I love this weather and I'm very glad to be holidaying in this country. Um, I also associate holidays with ice cream 
And uh, many of you may not know that it happens to be Damien's favourite food. He's, in fact, he's obsessed with ice cream. And I found out that um, July the 15th is National Ice Cream Day. But I'm sorry, Damien, we're now in August, so you've missed that. Also, actually, some people say July itself is National Ice Cream Month. But now we're in August, you've missed that. So I'm terribly sorry, Damien. <laughs> but... Um, so in line with the holidays, we're actually now going to take a look at some of the lovely photographs that the church family have sent in of what they've been doing this week. You may have heard in the news this week that the government have announced a £2.9 billion cut to the aid budget. That combined um, with the news last month of the merger of the Department for International Development with the Foreign Office, which could essentially mean that any aid we give is linked to new UK interests abroad. And also with Nestle announcing that they will no longer be using fair trade sugar and cocoa for their Kit Kats. It's actually not been a very good week of news for the for our poor, poorer brothers and sisters across the world. And not only are they struggling with poverty, they're also struggling with climate change and now the pandemic. It feels like the governments and the multinationals are using COVID-19 um, as a distraction and are, and are actually abandoning the poor. And this is not biblically, biblical, it's not what we're called to do. Uh, this week I shared on uh, Facebook an infographic which demonstrates energy poverty and it's quite staggering how when you look at a map of where energy is and where energy isn't uh, and don't forget that energy is fundamental to standards of living and also economic success it's staggering how there is just no energy in Africa at all it's actually something you can see from space at night the place is just not lit up. That of course impacts on the carbon footprint because that, you know they don't have a carbon footprint like we do over here so all of these issues are really important issues we need to think about mm. and I have been um, I, like many people I um, do the daily devotional 365 Lectio 365 and this week it's been um, focusing particularly on matters of justice and I, one particular reading struck me and I'm going to read it Isaiah 58 verses 6 to 9 the kind of fasting I want is this Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. Then my favour will shine on you like the morning sun and your wounds will be quickly healed. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. When you pray, I will answer you. When you call to me, I will respond. We are called therefore to seek justice in the world. The kind of fasting that God requires is for us to take action. Perhaps you could consider writing to the government um, about the cuts to the aid budget or to the merger of DFID with the Foreign Office. Perhaps you could think about um, signing the petition on change.org for Nestle 
um, because we don't want to stop supporting our fair trade cocoa and sugar farmers. We've had two sugar farmers, fair trade sugar farmers, in our church. We know the positive difference that fair trade makes to people's lives. Uh, perhaps you could think about swapping your favourite tea for fair trade tea or chocolate, perhaps, because again, it makes a difference and the stuff tastes good, really good. Actually, Damien, I've got a little treat for you. Ben and Jerry's fair trade ice cream. And now we're going to show you a short film on fair trade just to remind you of how good it is. It's always good to learn. I hadn't realised there was such a thing as National Ice Cream Day, but now I know uh, it's July the 15th, which is the day after my wedding anniversary. <laughs> uh, I'll be a bit double bonus for me next year. Um, today, the 2nd of August, uh, also is the anniversary, if you like, of National Friendship Day. Uh, we were thinking about this in the context of people uh, unlocking, and actually those particularly that are no longer shielding being able to go out and visit their friends and, uh, and get connected with their families again. And we want to thank God for our friends. Um, if you've been shielding at home for many months, it's quite easy to get institutionalised. It's quite easy to forget what real life is like or what real life has been like in the past. It can be quite traumatic, for example, going back to the shops. This week, uh, I did my first business trip. I went up to Newcastle. I went in a, a COVID-19 hotel, a COVID-19 restaurant, a COVID-19 cafe. Uh, it was all completely surreal. Then I had a COVID-19 customer visit, Co completely different to how life had been before. And of course, where things are unknown, they also breed fear. While we have to be sensible, maintaining social distancing and taking all the proper precautions, we also need to remember that God has us in the palm of our hands. And maybe it would pay to remember these very good verses. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 verse 9. And thank you, Adam Parks. And also... Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Damon and I were blessed last week um, to be able to stay in a friend's apartment down on the south coast um, in Rustington, which is quite near Brighton. And we experienced some different weather with sunshine, which was lovely, and rain, and then the wind. And we went and took some film of the kite and wind surfers out in the winds and the way they're catching, catching the wind and coming out of the safe harbours out into the um, open sea and it made us think um, of what life is like when you're coming out of sheltering and then you're coming out back into your communities. So we've made a film which we're going to use with our prayers to help us not to be afraid to remember that God is in charge and not to be scared to go out and catch the wind. Let's pray. Father as we come to the next phase of dealing with this pandemic give us courage and peace. Peace to know that you are in charge and you will never leave us nor forsake us. Give us courage to go out into our communities. Help us not to be afraid because it would be so much easier to stay in the safety of home. Give us wisdom so that we remain sensible and careful to retreat back to safe harbours when it's necessary. It's easy to forget that you are in charge, but you never leave us no matter what comes our way. So we pray for peace. We pray for courage, we pray for protection, and we pray for wisdom at this difficult time. Thank you, Lord, that you are in charge. 
that you know the challenge each one of us faces and that you've gone ahead of us to help us and strengthen us. Lord, we pray for provision for those who may be furloughed or who have been made redundant. Father, please provide for their needs. We ask that you bring on new entrepreneurs to the foreground at this time, that new industries may start to develop and thrive and that new jobs will be found for those seeking them. And we pray for the prodigals that have wandered far from you. Father, we pray that you will protect each of them and gently call them back to you. Lord, we pray for the homeless who have been housed throughout the pandemic and we ask for provision, accommodation and support for them as society begins to unlock. And we pray for wisdom for our government. We pray that they will know how to lead us and how to protect the country in the coming weeks and months. Lord, may those in government seek your face in all their decision making. Lord, we ask for your help for the many poor in other countries who are struggling not only with poverty, but also with COVID-19. Father, please lead our government in compassion for these people. That we would not cut our funding to developing nations, that we would be a country that leads other nations and not behind other nations in our commitment to the poor. Please help all of us to do what we can do to support the, home, the poor. Lord, please help all of us to do what we can do to support the home, both at home. Lord, please help all of us to do what we can do to support the poor, both at home and abroad. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would fall on each of us, that you would fill us with your breath and renew us. Lord, we pray that you would give each of us a new sense of purpose and fill us in with your peace. For we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, now it's time for the children and the young people to leave us and to continue their studies. Today, they're looking at Peter's denial and restoration. In the meantime, we're going to see an interview between Duncan and the Reverend Ian White. And that's going to be followed by the reading, which is brought to us this morning by Hope, my daughter. And that will be followed by the message from the Reverend Ian White. It's lovely to have Dr. Ian White with us today as he's going to be delivering God's word. Ian, it's lovely to have you. Thank you for speaking to us here at Tumbridge Wells Baptist Church. Um, it's, pleasure, Duncan. it's good to be with you. Great. I, I've learned that you are an academic background in maths, as well as an accomplished musician, and then you end up in the church, leading in significant churches over the years. Can you just say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I, I started off, as you say, in, in academic mathematics, studying the way that fluids flow through sponges, if you want to be precise. And um, then while I was uh, working for BP, I felt that God was calling us into the ministry and left, the, uh, uh, left mathematics and went into the Baptist ministry. And I've been there for, oh, 35 years now and thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it's had its ups and downs, as well you know, I, accept, I expect. But it's been a great privilege to be able to serve God in the, in the church. Brilliant. And music, you, I really appreciate you leading worship at the uh, church leaders conferences over the years. Are you continuing to do that? Yeah, I mean, music is something that's very precious to me. And although in these days of lockdown, um, worship live isn't happening, um, we can still really worship well, I think, through all sorts of routes. I mean, for me, I play the piano. Uh, other people can listen online and, and we can still engage with God in worship, even though we're confined to our houses a bit more than we used to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, we're learning much more to use CDs than we used to in the past and just listening and downloading. No, it's brilliant. Just thinking, have you learned anything in this time? Anything that's very, that's very important to you? I think, I think it's focused for me the importance of walking with God day by day in a way that doesn't necessarily depend on the, the, the superstructure of the church. I mean, I love worshipping with our church. Uh, I love meeting the people there. But now that's not possible. It's, it's meant that I've been able to focus a little bit more on, on where I'm going with God and study his word a bit more 
mm. bit, in a bit more of a focused way than I might have done otherwise. So it's been a good thing, really. Brilliant. Uh, and then just, we are having a national conversation uh, on, on the internet, at Baptist level, national level, and across the churches about how do we go forward as churches uh, with all this online things that we're doing at the moment. Have you got anything to add to the conversation that's going on? Oh, I expect, I expect a lot of this has already been said, but certainly um, people talk about going back to normal. I don't think we ever will. I think there'll be a new normal that we get used to. Um, and certainly if our experience over lockdown is anything to go by, that new normal will involve a lot more online material, a lot more online interaction um, than it does at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think churches that ignore the online world will find that effectively they've got the brakes put on their ministry. So things like uh, online services and live streaming and doing groups over Zoom and all that kind of thing, um, they're going to be much more part of our ministry than they ever were in the past. And I think that's a really good discovery that we've made during this period of lockdown. That there's a world of communicating the gospel out there and methods of doing it that we haven't quite explored yet and i think that's quite an adventure wonderful so I'm, what i'm hearing is you're saying the gospel stays the same but the method of how we communicate needs to change yes that's that's absolutely right the the gospel remains the same the message is the same and i don't think the message is affected by the means of communicating it. It's the message that has the power, at least if Paul in Romans anything to go by, and uh, it's the message that has the power and the method is the means we use to communicate it from one person to another. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Brian. Um, I'm really excited to listen to your message. So we're gonna end now and continue in the service and look forward to hearing you later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Duncan. God bless you. Okay. Psalm 1, verses 1 to 6. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Hello, my friends at Tunbridge Wells. My name is Ian White. I'm a friend of your pastor, and I'm so pleased to be able to join you this morning and for us to get into God's word together. In these days of limitation and lockdown, there's a lot of talk about health. We're concerned about healthy eating. We're concerned about our mental health. But what about our spiritual health? Now in Psalm 1, which you've just heard read, uh, we get some keys to thriving in the Christian life. And thriving spiritually often means thriving in many other areas of life too, like in our family or in our relationships or in our work. So if you have a Bible, maybe you'd like to turn to Psalm 1 and just take a look at the whole book. The, the Psalms are the songbook and the poetry of ancient Israel. And they still feed our souls today. I still find reading them a source of great comfort and strength and insight and wisdom. And in them, we can find almost every human emotion known to mankind. That there's praise and there's sadness. There's comfort and there's complaint. There's exuberance and there's anger. And there's often a wondering about the meaning of it all and where God fits in. And this first psalm sets the tone for all of the rest of them. Its main theme is how to be and to stay spiritually healthy, how to thrive in God. 
It also gives the converse message that when we live outside of God's uh, God's plan for us, his blessing is not with us and life is ultimately meaningless. Thriving spiritually, it seems to me, is encapsulated in the very first word of the psalm, blessed. Blessed is a rich word and it means happy or to be envied. Someone who's blessed is a kind of person who, who shows peace in the thick of trouble. And it's the kind of thing that other people notice about them. This blessedness, this state of being envied for their personal vitality is something God wants all of his people to enjoy. It's what we are made for. It's also significant that these words start off the whole book of Psalms which contains poems about all of life, the good, the bad and the ugly. It indicates that whatever our feelings or our state of life, God's aim for each of us is to thrive in our journey with him. King David, who wrote this psalm, reveals two overarching approaches to life that will help us to thrive. First, it's to associate with God. And second, it's to dissociate from evil, particularly people he describes as the wicked. And we'll see this coming out all the way through the psalm. So let's dive in, shall we? Have a look at verse one. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Now, immediately, we get into some wording that borders on the politically incorrect. There's a comparison between the righteous and the wicked. He's saying that if I want to thrive, there are people who are worth associating with and others whom I should avoid. Now, this is not a very PC subject in the 21st century. We, we tend to like to think of everyone as basically nice. But the Bible, and particularly Psalm 1, is more realistic. There are other psalms that say the same. Psalm 36, for example. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And Psalm 112. The wicked see what God does for the righteous and are vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. It is possible that someone watching me today is a train driver. And if you're a train driver, you'll know instantly what I mean when I talk about a SPAD. For those of us who are unfamiliar with the art of piloting a train, a SPAD is an acronym for a signal passed at danger. When a driver goes through a red light, that is a danger signal and it's something that's recorded and taken very seriously. Now in this psalm, it seems to me, there are three spads, three signals that we get that are warning signs to us. In verse 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. These phrases describe three danger signals, three stages of association that we need to be aware of. To walk in the ancient world, well, it was so common. I mean, most transport was on foot. To walk with someone was a perfectly normal practice. And if you were walking across town or from your village to the next, you might well hook up with someone to do the trip together. It's more companionable and it's safer to travel in a pair or in a group than it is by yourself. So it was a casual way of hooking up with someone. Now David uses a slightly more subtle concept though. He's not just talking about walking, he's talking about walking in step. So he's saying, be careful who you walk in step with. Be careful who your heart beats in time with. The next verb takes it a step further. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Now this implies that I'm not just, not just walking casually, I'm lingering around with them. 
my heart and my mind are being open to their influence. And the third verb describes a fuller commitment. Don't sit in the company of mockers. These are the people who sit at the same table in the pub or they share their ideas and make plans together. And the mockers are the ones who belittle and tear down with their words, the, one who, the ones who, uh, who, who look down on God and all that he can do for us. David is hinting that the person who opens himself or herself to this kind of influence is at risk of compromising their friendship with God. These are signals we can pass at danger. And David says, blessed is the one who avoids these. Actually, the, the Hebrew verb is in the perfect mood. So it carries the force of, uh, you know, blessed is the one who wouldn't be seen dead doing any of this. It's quite forceful. So is there an alternative? Well, have a look in verse two. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. What is it that you find the most pleasure in? What might keep you talking until two o'clock in the morning? Housework? Skydiving? For, for me, it's, it's going to be programming or piano music. In fact, while preparing this message, it was very tempting to have a break and do a bit of program development in Java or PHP or something. Some years ago, I met the author Jim Packer and hosted him before he was due to speak at a meeting. And I thoroughly enjoyed having a long chat with Jim. Now, I made some passing reference to a train and suddenly Jim became animated. I had no idea he was so passionate about trains and also very knowledgeable about them. Now, in fairness, he became just as passionate. He came alive later on that day when talking about the Bible. These were his sources of delight. It's what he spent his time mulling over. Now look at verse 2. Blessed is the one who meditates on his law day and night. Now that doesn't mean to say that we recite rules to ourselves. Let's not forget that in ancient Israel, the law of the Lord was not merely a set of rules to be followed. It was a way of life that was given to us to show the character and the grace and the mercy of God. I vividly remember a new Christian once saying to me, do you know, once I found the Bible dry, but now I can see that it is all so relevant to me. The blessed, happy, to be envied is the one who has God's character flowing through their self-talk, that sort of consistent internal nattering that we do to ourselves most of the time. There was an old preacher who once said, I want my people to have the Bible running through their blood. A bit of a gory illustration, but I think you can get the message. So what does a thriving Christian look like? Well, David describes him in verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf doesn't wither. It's a wonderful picture of a tree which over years of growth has become strong and vibrant. There are some moments when my heart misses a beat and one of them is when I see an older couple who are still dotty about each other. They still hold hands, they still walk down the road, they still show, show gratitude to each other. He still opens the car door for her. Something similarly wonderful about a man or a woman who is devoted to Christ today just as much as they were when they started, however long ago that was. They're still in love with Christ, still finding the Bible fresh and real, still displaying the fruit of the Holy Spirit, still enjoying God. These are the people whose lives are deep because they've, they've sunk their roots in God. Then look at verse three. Whatever they do prospers. It's almost like spiritually they've got the Midas touch. 
God's favour rests on their lives. And we're not talking about financial prosperity, we're talking about spiritual prosperity. A deep and meaningful walk with God that brings joy and peace into the present day. Well, then there's a change of tone. Verse 4 says, Not so the wicked. They are like chaff and the wind blows them away. So the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The wicked, says David, are like chaff. Now, the threshing floor would have been a familiar sight to the people who first used this poem. It was usually a hard, flat surface in the open air on which wheat was pounded and then thrown into the air. And the valuable grain, because it's heavier, would fall back to the ground, while the chaff, which was valueless, would be blown off into the wind. It was lightweight litter, dry and useless. And these people, says David, are like chaff in two respects. They are dry and they are unprofitable and therefore they're easily blown away. Come God's day of reckoning and they won't have a leg to stand on. So in our mind's eye, David has got us seeing a contrast. The righteous, solid like a fruitful tree, and the wicked, light and unstable. Look at the way that David talks about the wicked. They will not stand in the day of judgment. Later in the psalm, uh, the, the poets are going to speak about moments of wickedness and injustice, moments of exploitation, when the cries of the oppressed are not heard. One thing that has thrilled me in the past few months is the way that one particular group of people who have been ignored and suppressed for years have come to the fore. The Black Lives Matter movement has justice at its root. And whatever else people may say about it, there have been attitudes which come into this psalm's category of wickedness that have never before been acknowledged by such a vast group of people. People of every conceivable ethnicity and background are saying that black lives matter. Let's pray that this movement makes a difference in the long term in our nation. And then David finishes where he starts. He comes sort of full circle. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The Lord watches over the one, but leaves the other to perish. Now, something remarkable in this psalm. If I display the whole of the psalm like this, uh, we can begin to see some patterns, especially comparisons and contrasts. Verses 1 and 6 both compare the righteous and the wicked. Verses 2 and 5 contrast righteous people, that they have a deep and abiding character traits, and wicked people, they have a shallowness to their character, which means they don't stand when God looks closely at their lives. First part of verse 3 and verse 4 contrast the righteous and the wicked again. The righteous are solid and firm, the wicked are fragile and fleeting. And that just leaves the second part of verse 3. Whatever they do, prospers. Well, at the risk of being terribly technical, here here is the Greek letter chi. We can obviously overlay this letter on the psalm and we can begin to see its pattern. Technically, we call it a chiastic structure. And the significance is this. In many ancient writings, the key message was embedded right in the middle of the writing, often called the axis statement. And we find this structure all over the Bible. God wants you to be blessed in the way that he describes here. The central message of the psalm, whatever he does, the one who follows the Lord, the one who has God's law coursing through his veins, the man or the woman who wants to be like Jesus Christ, whatever they do prospers in God's sight. God's favour rests on them, on who they are. And what they do. My friends, God is on your side. 
if you live with him and for him and seek to model your life on Christ, God is on your side. And my prayer is that that blessing that he promises there will be your experience. God bless you. Thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save than Thou art. Thou my best by day or by night, waking or sleeping. Thy presence, my light Be Thou my wisdom Be Thou my true word I ever with Thee And Thou with me, Lord Thou my great Father and I, thy true Son, thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Be thou my shield and my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight, thou my soul shelter, and thou my high tower. Raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I need not, no man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, the first in my heart. I keep of heaven my treasure thou art high king of heaven when battle is done grant heaven's joy to me bright heaven's sun Christ our Whatever before, still be my vision, thou ruler of all. Christ of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision. Thou ruler of all. It's been wonderful to share our time together this morning. I'm just going to read the words from number six to bring our service to a close. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. God bless you and have a great week.